Well, before we go any further, I have to do like a little precursor. Um, when I first got saved, there was no way I was going to a church. I was way too cool for that. And, um, you know, I used to go to a, a Christian coffee house and they had Bible study and concerts. So that's how I was going to worship Jesus. Well, when I started to go to churches... I went to a lot of different kinds of churches, and this one I went to, a little church in downtown Royal Oak, it's not there anymore, so I won't even mention the name, but a friend of mine says, come on, it's cool, there's a bunch of people our age there, and so I went there, and I thought I was being, you know, I'm trying to be a Christian, I'm trying to learn the rules and the lingo of Christianese, because it's so much different than the world, and I went up to somebody, it was Easter, and I said, well, happy Easter. And they rebuked me. They said, you don't say that. And I'm thinking, why? I've been saying Happy Easter my whole life. Now that I'm a Christian, I can't say Happy Easter. Oh, no, brother, that's pagan. you got to say Happy Resurrection Day. And I really, I didn't know that. Nobody told me that. Oh, yeah, you say Happy Easter. That's pagan. Well, you know what? I'm the kind of guy you just, I just don't take things at face value. I study them. Well, does anybody believe that the Bible is the Word of God? Does anyone believe it's okay to read the King James Bible? Well, in Acts 12, verse 4, it says this, And when he had apprehended them, he put them in prison and delivered them to four quatrains of soldiers to keep him intending after, what? After Easter to bring him forth to the people. The word Easter is in the Bible. I say Trinity sometimes, and I say rapture sometimes, and those aren't in the Bible, and nobody gives me a hard time. But Easter, it's in the Bible. And you know who's saying this? The Apostle Peter. I don't think he was a pagan. And you know what that word Easter in the Greek actually means? It means the Paschal Lamb the Israelites were accustomed to slay and eat on the 14th day of the month of Nisan, which is the first month of their year. Now, some people will argue about, oh, Christmas is pagan, we shouldn't celebrate it. Nobody really knows when Jesus was born. You're right, nobody really knows when Jesus was born. I believe it was the Feast of Tabernacles. But we do know exactly when he was crucified, buried, and rose from the dead. It was on the 14th day of the month of Nisan, which is the first month of the year. So... In my sermon, if I don't say Happy Resurrection Day and I slip and say Easter, don't beat me up. It's okay. It's in the Bible. You know, God looks on the heart. So that's my precursor as I continue in my message. All right. Some of us were here on Friday, and we witnessed from the movie that we watched, The Scourging and the Crucifixion, and I ended the movie there. And if that was the end of the movie, if that was the end of the story, me and Rick and Jake were talking about, just think if Jesus never rose from the dead, I wouldn't be here. I don't think the world would be here. We would all be in a big mess. But he did rise from the dead. And you know what? Because Jesus never does anything without first telling his friends, his disciples, he warned them what was going to happen. In Mark chapter 8 and verse 31, Jesus said this, And he began to teach them, that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and of the chief priests and scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. He told them. So they, they weren't totally surprised when they went to Jerusalem and guess what? He was rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the scribes and then they killed him. But I don't know how much they remembered. I don't know how much they believed at that point. After three days, he's going to rise again? I don't know. That's, that's a lot to, to believe in. Now, they were there when they watched Jesus raise Lazarus from the dead after four days, but Jesus is only going to take three days. In Matthew chapter 12 and verse 40, Jesus said this, For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So he told them, this is what's coming, guys. Don't get upset. Don't be surprised. Just as Jonah was in that belly for three days, I'm going to be in the center of the earth for three days. But after three days, I'm going to rise again. But you know what? When it happened, 
it hit like a ton of bricks. I want to I want to share with you today. There's a lot of things you can talk about this message, but three things in particular I want to share with you about the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus, and what he did in this last week of his life here on earth, and then finally the resurrection that he taught us that we should implement in our lives. And the first one, the most obvious one, is love. Now, just think about it. Jesus was beaten. He was scourged. He was nailed to that tree. He, was, he had those nails pounded into his hands. And as he's laying there against that cross, I mean, his back had been whipped open so hard that, you know, the only way you can get air is to push on that spike in your foot to lift up to catch a breath. But when you do, your raw, open flesh back is riding up and down on that thorny, uh, you know, cross that's got all kinds of slivers and gouges and grooves in it. And then you just drop back down because of all the weight and your back rubs against that again. And as he's on this cross, suffocating, bleeding to death, something else happened to him. Something that nobody could see. All of a sudden, he felt this weight on him, this spiritual weight. And you know what it was? All these people in front of him that were screaming at him saying, well, you saved others, why can't you save yourself? Oh, you're the son of God. Oh, yeah, tear down the temple and in three days you'll rise it up. Come on, let's see you do something now. And he's watching all them. In the 22nd Psalm, it says they're wagging their tongue. He's compassed about by the great bulls of Bashan. The dogs are laughing at him. And he's looking at all these people. And you know what? What did he do? He said, Father... Forgive them, for they know not what they do. Incredible love. The first lesson we learn from this whole thing that Jesus went through is love. In John 15, 13, he says, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Does anybody here not want to be loved? You know, some people in this world are born to a good family where they have good parents that take care of them, treat them well, and they're loved, and they know they're loved. And then they have even maybe brothers and sisters that, you know, of course they fight like brothers and sisters do, but they know that they love one another. And then you even marry a spouse that loves you. And you have this feeling of love all throughout your life. And then you have kids that are good kids, and they love you. And you have all this love around you. Other people don't experience anything like that. And then there's some that fall somewhere in between. But it doesn't matter what category you find yourself in, you want to be loved. Because God put that need in our hearts. You know why? Because God is love. And that's how he wants to relate to us, through his love. And out of all the love you could ever receive, Jesus himself is saying there's no greater love that's available than this. That a man would lay down his life you know, in, in a spiritual courtroom, you got the devil over here as the accuser of the brethren, accusing me of all my sins, and you know what? I'm guilty. And just as God the Father is ready to slam the gavel and say guilty, Jesus stands up and says, wait a minute, I'll take his place. I'll take his punishment so he doesn't have to. There's no greater love than that. And that's what he did. He laid down his life. If somebody, you know, there's all kinds of war stories you hear about. Guys are fighting, you know, the bad guys, whoever the bad guys might be that time. And uh, somebody throws in a grenade, and he throws himself on it and blows up, but he saves his whole platoon. That's a lot of love. That takes a lot. Well, Jesus did that. But look at who he did it for. He did it for his friends. He didn't say he did it for his servants or his children, or his creation. He did it for his friends. So, you've got love expressed in the greatest way possible by Jesus giving his own life. That need in us can be met by Jesus. And you know what? It says of Abraham, he was the friend of God. 
And I always thought, man, if you could be called anything, wouldn't it be great to have God himself say, here's my friend? Well, you know what? He did say that. He said, it's me, and he's saying it's you. You're his friend. Because Jesus said for a man to lay down his life for his friends, he did that for you, and he counts you as his friend. There's no greater love. So then, all right, so what do we take from that? <clears throat> that we ourselves should live that selfless life and be willing to lay down our lives for a friend. You know, we live in a disposable society, and when you use something up, you just throw it away and move on. And unfortunately, we do that in this world with people. It's just, oh, you're my friend for now, but nope, no, not anymore. I don't need you anymore. And, you know, it's sad because very rarely do you find people who've had a friend like their whole life. That doesn't happen anymore. And Jesus warned us of something. He said in the last days, because iniquity is going to abound, the love of many is going to wax cold. And don't you see it in this world nowadays? People get offended so easy. It's like when you meet somebody, you can almost see an invisible chip on their shoulder, saying, oh, yeah, how long is it going to take before you knock this chip off my shoulder? Because they've been hurt in the past. And you know what? I don't want to hurt anybody. I don't think you do either. But we get offended so easy, and we say, oh, that's it. I chopped you off. You're not my friend anymore. Three times in my life I've had guys say this. I don't say this because I cringe when I hear this. But three times I've had guys of their own free will say to me, not once, not twice, but multitudes of times, you're my best friend, Dave. And you know what? All three of those guys that said that, I haven't seen them in years. They don't want nothing to do with me. Now, I'm not the perfect guy, and I'm probably not the perfect friend, but I would never leave them. I would never, like Jesus, I'll never leave you or forsake you. But these guys said, don't need you anymore. But you know what? Why can't we be that way? Jesus said, I'm going to love you to the death. I'll love you if it kills me. And that's what this world needs, love like that. Because don't you want to love like that? What if somebody came up to you and says, you're my best friend and I'm going to love you forever till next Tuesday? How would you feel? We can't put time limits on love. Jesus didn't. So the first thing, the greatest lesson we can learn from his death, his burial, and resurrection, is love. He said, I will never leave you or forsake you. That's what he's asking of us. He wants us to love each other that way. The next thing we can learn is just grace. Again, like I mentioned, Jesus is hanging on that cross, and he's looking at all these people. Did one of them, even one of them, deserve what he was doing for them? Not one of them. And when all that weight of the sins of the world came upon him, all these people down there that were just wagging their tongue and calling him names and mocking him, yeah, come on, get off that cross. All their sin was coming upon him. But you know what else? All the sin of all the people that lived before him was coming upon him. And all the sin of the people that were going to live in the future, like me and like you, was coming upon him. And he looked... And at any second, he could have just said, you know what, this isn't what I bargained for, I'm out of here. And a legion of angels would have came and rescued him and wiped everybody out. But he hung on that cross. There's an old Christian song, I forgot the name of it right now, it escapes me. But one of the lines says, they didn't have to nail him to that tree, his love would have held him there. He stayed there. Now none of these people deserved his love. And you know what? None of us deserve his love. Come on, we know. There's none righteous, no, not one. All of sin come short of the glory of God. Our good works are as filthy rags. We don't deserve what he did for us on that tree, but he did it anyhow. You know why? Because of grace. Because of his incredible, incredible grace. He hung on that tree, and he died for my sins and your sins. So what do we take away from that? He gave these people a break. Maybe we need to give people a break and stop being so critical. In Matthew 23 and verse 24, Jesus said this to the leaders of Israel, You blind guides, 
You strain at a gnat and you swallow a camel. And you know what? We look at people out there in the world and say, ah, they're a bunch of sinners. Boy, there's no hope for them. They're terrible. Look at what sin they do. But there but by the grace of God go I. You don't know what I was like before I knew Jesus. I would have smiled to your face and robbed your house when you were gone. I would have smiled to your face and told any lie I wanted to just to get away with it to see if I could get away with it. I tried to be a nice guy, but I did it my own way. I wasn't a good guy. I was rotten to the core. But God extended his grace to me, and you know what? It changed my life. And I haven't been the same for 40 years since then. Maybe one of these people out here in the world, they need some grace extended to them. Now, when you say that, I know what happens. Everybody, their ears perk up. Oh, 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 Pastor Dave's getting real close to that greasy grace. Do we just let everybody slide with whatever they want to do and just get along with them? No, I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that at all. But I'm saying maybe just a little bit of grace, a little bit of mercy we can show towards people. Because remember what you were like before you gave your life to Jesus? And somebody extended mercy to you? I'll never forget what Dan hits. Our friend from Reconciliation Ministry who's been here a number of times told me. He said, you know, when I was full blast living the gay lifestyle and I was as sinful as sin could be, he said, you know what got me into God's kingdom? I got sick one time and these Christians came over and they gave me soup and food and they wanted to make sure, do you need any medicine? Do you need anything? And they never once said I was a sinner, never once told me I'm going to hell, never once judged me. They just loved me into the kingdom. Now some people you can do that. Other people you have to, by fear, pull them out of the fire. But most people respond pretty well to mercy and grace. And we need to be able to extend that to people without crossing that line and saying, okay, well, whatever you do, that's fine. Come on in. We love you. Well, yeah, God loves us, but he doesn't, he'll never bless sin. He doesn't excuse sin, and we can't either. But in our attempt to reach out to somebody who doesn't know Jesus and who hasn't accepted that grace, we need to just give them a break. Because remember what you were like before you were a Christian? Don't you want somebody, didn't you want somebody to give you a break? And you know what? That extends even into the Christian world. Some of us that are Christians. It breaks my heart to hear this, but I've been in the church for 40 years. Some of you have been here a long time. And I hate this statement, but I've found it to be true. Christians are the only ones that eat their own wounded. And how many times, oh, look at what he's doing. I knew he wasn't, a, I knew he wasn't saved. Look at her. Oh, I can't believe she says she's saved, and look at what she's doing. And we just want to chop them off, throw them out. Yep, they're just fakes. Throw them out, hypocrites. Well, here we are. Aren't we becoming like these spiritual leaders that are blind, we're straining at gnats and swallowing camels? Let's look at the big picture. The big picture is we're all sinners, and we all need a Savior, and we all get to heaven one way with the blood of Jesus covering us. Your sins may not be as bad as mine, or your sins may be worse than mine. It doesn't matter. The blood of Jesus will erase any sins and cover them, and we all get to the Father one way, by Jesus the Son covered in his blood. Nobody's better than anyone else. And we need to just quit straining at all these gnats. You know, we can just nitpick everybody to death. Hey, let me ask you a question. Does everybody in this room believe exactly like I do every jot and tittle? Sorry, you're not saved. You're all going to hell. Because I'm the only one that's right. All right, now you, all of you, forget about me, all of you within this room, do you all agree with each other? Every jot and tittle exactly? Well, which one of you is saved? Which ones are you going to hell? I always find it so interesting when someone's alive, we will nitpick, we'll study everything they said and did. Oh, see this, they can't be saved. Oh, I think they're heretics. Oh, they're leading us into a, a false religion. But when people die at their funeral, we all say, oh, well, they love Jesus. They're all going to heaven. In our life, we nitpick each other to death. But in our death, oh, God forgives us. We're all going to heaven. Why can't we just, you know, it's tiring it's draining to always nitpick. There's a, there's a saying that the Marine Corps has. I'm not saying it's 
the best of sayings, but it says, kill them all and let God sort them out. You know what I think our, us Christians should say? Our motto should be, love them all and let God sort them out. Amen. My job is not to make sure you're perfect. Because if it is, I might as well just jump off a bridge right now because you're never going to be perfect. And guess what? Neither am I. My job is to just love you and tell you the truth of God's word and pray that your heart's right with God and we're all going to dance on streets of gold together. Amen. That I can do. But to nitpick, do you believe exactly? Are you a pre-tribber, mid-tribber, post-tribber? Do you believe in this is a pagan holiday or this not a pagan holiday? Do you believe in this? Do you believe, oh, do you like this teacher? Do you like that teacher? Oh, you said this. You said, man, I'm tired. That'll kill you. Walking around like a blind guide, straining after every gnat. But you're swallowing this big camel that everybody is a sinner. and We all got to get to the same heaven, and there's only one way to get there, and it's Jesus the Son. So you know what? None of those people that died on the cross, myself included, deserved it. But Jesus did it anyhow because of his incredible, incredible unmerited favor called grace. So you know what? Maybe we should just start extending some grace to people and have a little bit of mercy. The third thing that I want to talk about that is shown to us by the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus, is hope. You know, those disciples, even though they heard Jesus say, I'm going to be rejected and they're going to kill me and I'm going to three days later rise from the dead. And he told the story about Jonas and the, th the whale and three days later, the Son of Man's coming out of the center of the earth. You know what, you can hear all kinds of things, but when you're in the middle of a heartache, in the middle of trauma, your mind just kind of goes blank. And you're just like, you don't know what to believe. Man, what did he mean three days in the belly of the whale? I mean, is that some kind of spiritual thing? He also said, I got to eat his body and drink his blood. He didn't mean that literally. Maybe he's not literally coming back. I don't know. When Jesus died on, on Friday, guess what? He was dead. This is no Passover plot. Him and Lazarus didn't come up with this secret elixir there for him to drink and fake his death, and then later Lazarus stole his body and said, Oh, look, he rose from the dead. Well, if that's the case, he would have died later. Where's his body? No, he was dead. He was deader than dead. There was not one ounce of life in his body. He was dead. And on Saturday, knowing all that the disciples knew, that must have been a pretty depressing day. Those of you that were here Friday, you saw in the movie the Apostle Peter crying his heart out saying, Oh, God, forgive me. Save me, Lord. Help me. Can you imagine what these disciples went through on Saturday? They're probably thinking, Man, I was just minding my own business. Was I happy? No, but I was just making my way through life. I had a job. I had a business. I was just taking care of my family. I was just going to work every day. And then all of a sudden, this guy comes walking up to me, and he says, leave everything and follow me. And there was something about him. His words just were different than anyone I ever heard before. And something resonated in my soul, and I dropped my fishing nets, my tax collector tools. I dropped my being a zealot. I dropped my all these things that I did, and I followed him. For three and a half years, I gave up everything and followed this guy for three and a half years. And man, did I see some incredible things. I saw dead people rise. I saw blind people, their eyes open. I saw him not once but twice feed over 5,000 people with just a couple of loaves of bread. I saw him walk on water. I saw lepers have skin like babies. And Peter, James, and John can say, we went up to a mountain and we saw Moses and Elijah. Man, we saw some incredible things. And then when he was on that donkey and he's riding down that road into Jerusalem... And everybody's screaming, oh, Hosanna, save us, son of David. We're thinking, yeah, he finally made it. He's going to now be the king of Israel, kick these Romans out of here. We got it made. That's why James and John, their mama, went up to Jesus and said, when you come into your kingdom, can my son sit on one side and my other son sit on the other side? And Jesus said, you don't know what you're asking for, lady. Amen. Typical Jewish mama wants her son to rise the corporate ladder. And Jesus says, you don't know what you're asking for. But I'm telling you something, they will drink of the cup I'm going to drink of, but it ain't the way you think. 
But these guys were pretty depressed come Saturday. Did I waste those three and a half years of my life? I don't have a Savior anymore. I don't have a Lord. I don't have anyone to lead me anymore. What am I supposed to do? He's dead. He's dead. Well, with a Christian, when something dies, there's always a resurrection. Hallelujah. There's always a resurrection. Because we know the story. Mary saw him first, Mary Magdalene, and she came running back to the other disciples who were still moping around and said, he's alive, I saw him. They said, yeah, crazy old woman, seeing aberrations or ghosts or something, or she just flat out nuts, I ain't believing you. But they were in into that tomb, and it was empty. And then Jesus appeared, and then finally he appeared the second time to Thomas and said, touch me, handle me. He was alive. That which was dead, and he was dead, is now truly alive. But you know what? He's more alive now than he was for those 33 and a half years he was on the planet Earth. He's more alive now than he was for those three and a half years he was walking the earth in ministry. And you know what? Every single one of these disciples is dead, and they're with him. And do you think they regret spending that three and a half years with him now? Uh Uh-uh. No way. So what can we take away from this? we got to have hope. We got to have hope. Something in your life may die. A friendship, a relationship, a job, a car, a house, a dog, a car, a cat, you fill in the blanks. A friend, whatever, anything, it may die. And it may be dead, actually dead, just like Jesus was actually dead. But when you're a Christian, that's not the end of the story. There's always a resurrection. Did you ever hear that old saying, when God closes a door, he opens a window? Amen. Well, if your, your door has slammed shut and you've tried to open it and it won't open, start looking for a window. Because with Jesus, there's no such thing as death. There's always a resurrection. And you may say, yeah, but it's so hard to believe. What do you, th- what do you think if you would have sat down and talked to Thomas and John and Bartholomew and Simon and all these guys on Saturday? What do you think you guys are going to be doing next week? I don't know. I guess we've got to go back to our old jobs and our old life if they'll take us back. Not even knowing the next day their lives are going to be changed for eternity. Well, you might be in the middle of something dying or something's dead. And you may be so discouraged and so depressed and say, there's no hope. It died. I put all this time into it and it died. There's no hope. In Isaiah... And in Matthew, this scripture, Old and New Testament, is given, and it's talking about Jesus' ministry. Matthew twelve twenty. It says, A bruised reed shall he not break, and a smoking flax shall he not quench, till he send forth judgment unto victory. That means I just when I read this, I picture Jesus walking through a field, and here's all these reeds. I used to own five acres of property up north, and I used to go through all the property all around there, and there's some swamp land and, you know, cattails and, you know, hang on trees and, you know, just walking in the field. I loved it. And then there's these reeds. But just imagine Jesus walking through that field, and there's a reed that's bent over, and it's bruised, and it's ready to break. Now, Jesus isn't the kind of guy that would go up there and say, oh, you're not perfect, snap, done. You know what he would do if he saw a bruised reed? He would bind it with gauze, very gently. And he'd put his hands on it, and he'd stand it up, and he'd speak into it and say, rise up and be stronger than ever before. If you're trying to make a fire because you're cold or you want to eat something, and all you've got is just this flax, which is just basically cotton, and you can't get it to to burst into flame, and it's just smoldering. Jesus wouldn't walk up to you and just, that's no good. I want a hot fire. That's no good. I'm getting rid of this thing. No, Jesus is the kind of guy that would get on his hands and knees and he'd get that little smoldering. It's like this close to going out. And he'd get that smoldering little cotton and he'd just breathe in it and put his hands around it, cup it, and breathe in it until oxygen, the oxygen of God, would start to raise that up until it started to burn. Then he'd put on maybe some kindling and then finally a big fat oak log and it would be a raging fire. So you may be in the midst of something dying or something's dead, and you think, that's it, there's no hope. 
Well, on Saturday, two things happened. One disciple by the name of Judas, no hope, I blew it, I gave up, I quit, and he went out and hung himself. But there's another disciple that denied Jesus and did some bad things. His name was Peter. And he says, man, I blew it, but I'm hanging in here. I'm going to see what happens next. And then did you ever hear the Apostle Peter? (laughs) I think he did pretty good because he kept going. He didn't give up. Judas gave up. That equals death. Peter says, my Lord's dead, and I, I don't see anything in the future, but I'm not giving up. And Sunday was on the way, and Jesus rose from the dead. In Ezekiel chapter 37, God takes this prophet Ezekiel, this Old Testament prophet, and he takes him to this valley. And he says, I want you to look out over this valley. And there's all these dry bones. They're bones of human beings. And not only is there no flesh on them, no skin on them, no human organs, but they've fallen apart because they're so old and they're just bones. And not only are they just like bones that are wet or have a little bit of moisture, they're dry. They've been out in this, they got dust on them. They've been out in the valley for so long. They're dry bones, totally just falling apart. And God takes them to something that's deader than dead. And he says, look at this Ezekiel. He says, this represents Israel. And he says, there's no hope. Let's just move on. Is that what he said? In Ezekiel 37, 4, Ezekiel says, And again, he, meaning God, said unto me, Prophesy unto these bones, and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. We each have a choice in life. With the situations that we face, we can say, Well, it doesn't look the way I want. It doesn't sound the way I want. Smell, taste, feel. So I guess this isn't going to happen. This isn't the way I want. And we can be carnal. Or we can be a spirit man. And we can look into the spirit world and say, I don't see the way things are. I see the way they're going to be. And look at, God said, prophesy. Speak to these dead bones. I mean, that doesn't make any sense. Speak to an inanimate object. Speak to him. And what did he say? didn't say come alive. He said, hear the word of the Lord. God's word can make anything come alive. God's word can change anything. That's what this whole day is about. A Jewish preacher is dead, and he's in a tomb, and he's deader than dead. But the word of God made him alive, and he's still alive today. And anything in our lives that we think, oh, I'm giving up, there's no hope, I'm dying, it's dead, there's no hope. You can be Judas and give up and go hang yourself. Or you can say like Peter, I don't understand, but I'm hanging until Sunday. And what God told Ezekiel to do, you speak to these dry bones. And you know what happened? These bones started to stand up, started to rattle, shake them bones. The knee bones connected to the thigh bone and all, you know that old song. And they started to connect together and they stood up and they looked like human skeletons. And then all of a sudden, Organs started to pop on there, and then muscle and sinew, and and then skin, and then they looked, they were live, or they were people, but they weren't alive, they were dead. And then the word of God came and breathed life into them, and they were all dancing around, and Israel was alive. That's representative of anything in our lives that we think is dead. Don't give up. You can be Judas. You want to let's all go jump off a cliff because things aren't the way I want them to be in my life. Or you can be like Peter and say, you know what? I'm holding on to the end. Jesus said this phrase to the disciples a number of times. He said, oh, ye of little faith. I don't want him to say that to me. Yeah, but I can't see it. It just doesn't make any sense. You know, I've been, the last couple months have been pretty tough for me and Bob. We've been just like taking one punch after another. Every day, we look at each other and we say, all right, no bad news today, okay? No bad news. This is a no bad news day. And then the phone rings or something happens. And it's been like like a boxer in a ring, just one punch after the other. And the other day, I'm walking. What I have to do first thing in the morning after I open the building and turn on all the lights is I go upstairs and get the mail, and I walk out and put the mail in the mailbox. 
And, of course, I'm talking to the Lord all the way through the parking lot. And I was walking through, and I was just saying, well, Lord, here we are, another day, doing a job I don't want to do, what I want to do I can't do, and just griping and complaining, being miserable. And the Lord gave me two verses. Proverbs 3, 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not unto your own understanding. Yeah, but God, don't you understand the things that are going on in my life? I don't care. It doesn't matter. You trust in me. Don't lean on your own understanding. You think you know everything? You don't know nothing. Amen. I'm the God that rose Jesus from the dead. I'm the God that made this valley of dry bones turn into the living Israel. You trust in me. You just trust in me and watch and see what I do. Don't lean under your own understanding. And then in Job, you know, Job was a guy who, I don't ever want to be Job. He went through some hard times. Lost his kids, lost his house, lost his health. His friends, you know, came around just said, oh, come on, just to confess. What's kind of, you got to be in some kind of sin to have all this happening to you. And they just beat him. He lost his friends. And his wife said, just give up and die, would you? But Job wasn't going to give up. And in Job 13, 15, he said this, Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. But I will maintain my own ways before him. And we have to get to a place that says, you know what? I don't care if God kills me. I don't care if this world kills me. I don't care what happens. I'm going to trust him, even if it kills me. And in the meantime, I'm going to maintain my ways. I'm just going to keep doing what he's told me to do. Until I can't do it no more. And I'm going to, in every decision, I'm going to try to make the decision that I think would please God. And I'm just going to keep on going. And I'm going to trust in the Lord. I'm not going to lean into my own understanding. I don't want to, I don't want to be Judas and hang myself on Saturday when the next day Jesus is going to rise from the dead. Just think if Judas wouldn't have killed himself. There may be the gospel of Judas. The real one, not the Gnostic gospel. Who knows what God could have done in his life. I'll close with this. This is my last verse to you. This is the test for every Christian. You may like it, you may not like it, but it's there and it doesn't go away. It's Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. But without faith, it is impossible to please Him. Do you want to please God? I do. Some people couldn't care less. Some people don't even think there is a God. Some people who think there's a God, they say, well, you know, He's got his deal, I got mine, I'll meet him someday when I die. But there's even some Christians that say, well, yeah, to a certain extent. Do you want to please him or do you want to please yourself? What do you want to do? If you want to please God, it's impossible to do that without this thing called faith. Now, how do you, how do you exercise this faith in a way that's going to please him? He shows us two ways. The first way... If you're going to come to God, you have to believe that he is. So most of us got that down. I believe there's a God. I'm pretty sure you all do too. So that's easy. All right. That was an easier test than I thought. Got that one aced. But here's the hard part. That he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. I first want you to notice that it doesn't say he's a rewarder of those that perfectly seek him. Because if that was the case, I'm in big trouble. Because I've never been perfect, and I never will be. And I don't want to scare you, but neither have you, and neither will you. I'm glad it doesn't say for those that perfectly seek him. It says those that diligently. Diligence means I'm walking down this narrow road, sometimes I fall off. Sometimes I go this way. Sometimes I look that way. Sometimes I hear that way. I smell this way. Sometimes I even turn around and go backwards a little bit. But I just get back up. No matter how many times I've been knocked down, I get back up. No matter how many times I get pushed off the road, I get back on. And I just keep moving forward. I don't know how far I am down that road, but I'm just not going to stop walking down that narrow road. That's diligence. I've told you this example before. When an airplane leaves Metro to go to LAX, all that pilot is doing is constantly correcting his flight path because the winds and the currents are blowing him off track he's just constantly correcting constantly correcting and that's what this means to diligently seek him 
Sometimes I believe this, I hear this, I think this, someone tells me that, I experience this, and I get blown off course, but always change my course to get right back on that narrow road. And it says, if we diligently seek him, he's a rewarder. Yeah, but I'm not seeing it. I'm not seeing any reward. Well, you may not for a while. You may be stuck in Saturday. Or you might be in the middle of, he's doing something you can't even imagine. You know, I'll just, I'll tell you, New Hope Christian Church has been in existence for 16 years. This is not what I had in, in mind for us. I wanted us to be much bigger, have our own building, and have a lot more things going on. And that's just not happening for right now. But you know what? When I, when I tell you all to greet each other and say, tell each other I'm glad you're here today. And I'm up here holding my guitar and I'm watching all of you. The Lord says to me, which one of these people is not worthy for you to stay here and fight the good fight so they have a church where they can hear the word of God? Which of these people is worth leaving for? If there's two people here, then there's three of us. Jesus is right in the middle. If there's 3,000 here, it doesn't make any difference to Jesus. I don't know what God's doing in my life, your life, or New Hope Christian Church, but I know this. If we keep diligently seeking him, he's going to reward us individually in our private lives and as a church corporately. And I'm never going to stop believing that because the day I do, that's the day I turn into Judas and I go hang myself. And I'm not doing that. I'm hanging on to Sunday because I know Sunday's on the way. So the way I started this service, I said he is risen and you said what? Well, you know what? That hasn't changed. He's risen. So have hope. Love people the way Jesus loved you. Show grace and mercy to people the way you want Jesus to show grace and mercy to you. And don't ever, ever, never, ever, ever give up hope. Because you give up hope. Proverbs tells us when the people, if they don't have a vision or hope, they perish. And I ain't never given up. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for the resurrection. It is the epitome of hope. And Lord, even when something dies to a Christian, it's just time to wait for a resurrection. And that's what I'm waiting for. Those that I've asked to help with communion, would you please go prepare? And I want you to take this cup and this juice together, and we're all going to partake together. <clears throat> Water you turned into wine And you opened eyes of the blind there's no one like you no there's not Lord there's none like you and into the darkness you shine and out of the ashes we rise there's no one like you Oh, there's none like you And my God is greater My God is stronger God, you are higher than any other Our God is healer And he's awesome in power Our God he is our God And if our God is for us Then who could ever stop us And if our God is with us Then what or who could ever stand against us Our God is greater Our God is stronger God, you are higher than 
any other. Our God, He's my healer, and He's awesome in power. Our God, He is our God. He's our God. There is no greater way, no other method, no other instant, no other example, nothing in existence can prove to another human being how much you love them than to die for them. And Lord, the devil, ah, he's good at his job. He accuses, he steals, he kills, he destroys. He wants to take our hope, our joy, and say, there's no hope, just give up. But he's a liar. He's a liar. My Jesus is alive, and he loves us. And he calls us his friend. He's got a plan for each one of us. Lord, before they captured you, before they judged you, before they scourged you, before they nailed you to that tree, you had a last dinner with your friends. You said, no longer do I call you servants, but I call you friends. And you said, I want you to do something. Take and eat of this bread, because this is my body, and it's broken for you. So, Lord, 2,000 and some years later, we're still holding in remembrance what you did for us. We have this bread in our hands. Let us partake of it. And remember, Jesus, his body was broken for you. Let's partake of this bread. Lord Jesus, when you took the cup, you said, drink this. This is my blood. The life is in the blood. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. And you said, I'm not going to drink this again until I drink it with you in my Father's kingdom. Man, I can't wait for that banquet feast, that wedding feast. I can't wait. Oh, Lord, that's going to be glorious beyond description. But in the meantime, we have this little cup to remind ourselves that you hung on that cross and let the creation that you made whip the flesh off your body and you were bleeding profusely. You let them pound nails in your hands and your feet and the blood was pouring out. And then you let them put a spear in your side and the pericardial sac around your heart was so full of fluid and blood, it just came pouring out. And you basically just bled out. There was no blood left in your body. And what we're holding in our hands right now, that cup represents that. And it's the juice of hope. It's the juice of resurrection. It represents even though you were dead, you rose and you're alive forever. So, Lord, as we partake of this, I'm asking you to challenge each one of us. Anything in our lives that we think, no hope, it's dead, that you will challenge us to believe. There's a resurrection coming. Let's partake of this cup together. Praise God. Praise team, come on up. And if I could have... um. The ushers take the missions offering.
nobody can stand against. Nobody can stand against the hand of the living God. Praise God. Glory to you. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the greatest sacrifice. We were talking about the love that Jesus had for us, that he laid down his life for his friends. But Father, Jesus said of you, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Thank you, Lord. Help us to receive that love. Help us to walk in that love. Help us to express that love and show that love everywhere we go. Always with a heart full of hope anticipating what you're going to do because you're not dead and you're still a miracle working God in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. God bless you and happy resurrection day Easter.